This is Dominic Stucker welcoming you to the second online session of the Transformation Literacy Conference 2023. It's an immense, immense pleasure to have all of you here again. I imagine many of you were with us on Monday when we were focused on narratives and metrics for moving toward inclusive democracy and good governance. We had speakers from around the world, including from Brazil, from the United States and Kenya, and they were talking about topics as diverse as transforming funding approaches in the global south, focused on centering the voices and leadership of marginalized communities, and shifting from cultures of dominance to cultures of belonging. There were 75 of you who joined us on Monday from over 25 countries, and you emphasized a key challenge around addressing the narratives of capitalism and exploitation, you also put forward a key solution to the panel in terms of promoting and building capacity for genuine community-led development. There are connections between narratives and metrics to the topics today around innovation and regulations. For example, narratives that focus too much on threats that we face might lead to a feeling of powerlessness and maybe even a lack of courage for the innovation that's so needed uh, to move towards sustainability. In terms of metrics, metrics measure what we deeply care about in our transformative initiatives and regulations, a topic for today, can help enshrine such metrics to better measure the well-being of humanity, of the community of life, of the planet as a whole. The, the structure of our conference is structured around what we call transformation enablers, what I was just talking about. We had enlivening narratives and empowering metrics on Monday. And today we're moving to life-enhancing innovations and guiding regulations. Our, our goals today are to celebrate and learn from different transformation practitioners, partners, funders, academics. We have a, an inspiring lineup of speakers who are going to share their perspectives um, from Finland, from the United States, and from Kenya. We'll have a chance to discuss and trans uh, transformation challenges and possible solutions, as well as broadly helping to enliven a community around leading transformative change collectively. So we're inviting you into a conference where we want to create a respectful space. So we ask that all of us, we should all please embody respect in our interactions and also patience with any technical glitches, uh, express our views clearly and concisely, and listen with an attitude of seeking to understand. Um, and related to this one, we're trying to suspend our own judgments and remain open to, to others' perspectives. Um, we're, we're very excited to be able to convene this conference on an annual basis and really glad for the diversity of participants that are here. Uh, we're going to go into more depth at this time on the two transformation enablers that are our focus today. Um, so I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, Elizabeth Kuhn, uh, for an input. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a little bit about our framing today, which is innovation and guiding regulations. And maybe as a first thing, when we talk about um, innovation or life enhancing innovation, what we really mean is, or what we try to express here is, of course, the focus on like bringing together diverse expertise, processes of, of agile learning, action, collective creativity, all of that very much anchored in an understanding of sustainability that is really geared towards um, life on planet Earth. So it picks up very much on what you also mentioned um, just in the poll now uh, regarding that innovation really needs to um, imitate sustainable life it needs to uh, it needs to be geared towards an improvement also of quality of life and so in innovation in general or life enhancing innovation in particular really emerges when um, first of all when we provide spaces for creative invention so this can be both like passive and active i'm thinking like incentives so financial incentives visibility all of this can really um, support this provision of, of spaces. There's also around support for continuous improvement through, um, can be rewards, can be knowledge networks. Um, we have learning networks, we have communities of practice, but also 
importantly, what features here is also this recognition and support through, let's say, awards that recognize really, really excellence and expertise and mastery. And finally, it also emerges when you remain agile um, and in continuous collaborative uh, exchange. So an important element here or example would be to ensure spaces for prototyping, not only on the technical level, but also in the ways of how we really work together. So organize, how do we organize initiatives? Um, let's say it, even connecting back to what we heard um, uh, Monday in the first session, uh, you know, different funding approaches. Um, this is also a way that uh, innovation manifests itself and that is necessary and that goes very much in this uh, agility element. And so if we look at this to democracy and, and governance lens is that um, we can contribute to this through innovation in particular when we create such spaces that really promote inclusion and um, also support the democratic narratives. So we really need to rethink here this narrative of the individual genius that engages followers and supporters and really shift our perspective towards an approach that promotes and recognizes creativity as a deliberate and really inclusive collective process. We also need to have a look at, at ensuring that our innovation processes are embedded in very good governance structures. So this refers to the often crucial question of, you know, what prototypes or experiments will be upscaled and how do we decide that innovations are truly sustainable. So I'm thinking in particular, like of all the implications that we have regarding innovative technologies, let's say the renewable energies, the green energies, all the debate we have around um, fabricating these technologies and really thinking through the whole chain of these technologies of whether this is really uh, sustainable or not. And so who makes the decision that such and such technology is actually sustainable? And so as a third point regarding the agility point, it is it is crucial and it is also a, a massive opportunity to really foster this agility in innovation through democratic feedback mechanisms. So a move forward, um, when you move forward with our sustainability transformations, we have a chance and an obligation to connect them to very strong democratic consultation and feedback mechanisms. Um, a so that we can really learn as much as possible about the actual impact and effect, both social and ecological and also economical. So that much for, for innovation. And if you're looking at um, the, the, the tandem that we have here today, the second part of, um, of, our, of our transformation ablers we're looking at today, guiding regulations in general is, um, uh, let's say it's it's the conviction that we really need to balance both global to regional to national to local sustainability frameworks. So this can mean tax incentives, subsidies across all administrative levels possible, while ensuring that they don't contradict or prevent each other. So I think of in Europe we have this very famous example. I think of agriculture regulations. You know who on the EU level regional level, but then on the country level are often contradictory instead of complementary. So that can very easily happen. And um, uh, in addition to these uh, regulations that are settled by policymakers or, 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 or legal makers, is that we really complement the policies and laws also with co-developed voluntary standards. So combine different sort of regulations from the binding ones to those incentivized to those that are also voluntary. And it's a combination that really makes the magic here. And so guiding regulations as a transformation enabler really emerges when we have this balance here, when we have this complementary uh, approach of policies and laws, binding ones, but also voluntary ones, incentivized ones. Um, and finally, if we also embed these contributions and resource allocations, um, to public goods. So a very important element or, or concrete example that I think of here is that um, uh, I think just this March, we have this high seas treaty uh, that has been realized by the UN, uh, which is really incredibly um, um, standard setting regarding protecting marine biodiversity in international waters. And it also includes the corresponding 
financial allocation to actually realize this new standard and this new this new agreement. And so if you look at uh, guiding regulations to democracy and governance land, um, we have again the opportunity, but also I think the implication to say we can advance this equity and inclusion in societies through a redistribution also of resources on different levels. And we can make sure that through regulations, we also ensure a very transparent and inclusive governance process for the development of laws and regulations. So this includes not only consultation mechanisms, but also review mechanisms uh, for policies and for laws. And finally, um, that's a point that's, let's say, often criticized as not having enough bite or teeth, um, but it shouldn't be underestimated the power also of communities of change around voluntary standards. So voluntary standards, they often spring up from communities of change or most importantly, they often form around voluntary, of voluntary standards that actually first get developed. So value chain, um, value chain standards uh, for sustainable production are a really good example here. And so if we look at innovation and regulation and kind of their connection, why we also have this as a frame here today, is that, of course, structures and governance systems, they need to provide space for innovation. There we are back at that creative space. And this interconnection is, is, is very much going in both ways. So regulations can offer space, um, uh, at the same time, also incentives and sustainability guidance um, for innovation. So it's both an opportunity, but um, also a very clear framing that is provided here. And so social and emerging uh, social innovation, uh, on, on the other hand, can also emerge as a response to regulation crises. So we just have to look at global financial or, you know, the economic crisis that we've lived in the past, um, that a lot of regulation activity actually came out um, uh, and also innovation around this came out of crises that were essentially regulation crises. And so with that, I hand it back to our um, panel speakers to um, to look at and tell us a little bit more about how this looks very concretely in practice. Thanks very kindly, Elizabeth, for offering us a, a conceptual framework for the day. Uh, I think many of the examples that you mentioned will be touched on in different ways by our speakers who, like on Monday, actually come from three different continents. Um, today, we get to welcome Rili Lapalainen from Finland. We'll have Arun Ben Katesan uh, from the United States and also Ivan Waweru uh, from Kenya. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Tim Andrew could not make it today. He was all the way on an, an urgent uh, work matter. Uh, but he did contribute to the presentation and Yvonne is, is able to take that up. So I'd, I'd like to start by welcoming really onto the stage and introducing, I'll introduce one by one as people uh, make their inputs. Um, really, Lapalainen is chair of Bridge 47 and director of Sustainable Development Fingo. Um, FINGO is an umbrella organization for civil society organizations in Finland. And as a director, um, really is advocating for resources to go to CSOs and is also uh, helping build capacity among Finnish CSOs or civil society organizations um, to work with other civil society organizations around the world. Uh, today, we get to hear from really on innovation for global citizenship education in Europe. It's an immense pleasure to have you here with us, really. Uh, the floor is over to you for 12 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. So it's just really, really happy to be here. Exactly, I'm based in Strasbourg and really so sorry about the noise which might come outside of, of this room where I'm I'm attending on, on this, this evening event. But really, really happy to be here and, and hope to really uh, contribute as well about this great debate already, which Elizabeth very kindly made this good, good um, introduction that 
So perhaps uh, if you, Dominic, could put the second slide, um, I could shortly start with uh, page 47, which I think it explains quite a lot on the examples what I'm going to, going to share with you. So the page 47 is a global network um, which we created even before the Agenda 2030 negotiations started, where the UN came together and all the member states agreed to really put effort on the implementation of the sustainable development for, for the future of, of the whole world. And in that time, we, we realized that exactly the role of the education in a wider understanding, including the formal, non-formal, informal education and the lifelong learning as well, is fundamentally important to, to, to really achieve about the sustainable future for all of us. And, and that's why we, we collected the friends all over the world. Now we have more than 1,000 uh, colleagues um, representing different kind of actors from civil society to academics, civil servants, even parliamentarians who are interested to really make space for, for civil society and the other ones to really use the all kind of um, opportunities for, for really taking the education as, as a tool. And of course, promoting about the STD 4.7, which I think that really captures very well about the aspects of the uh, global citizenship, like we in the shortened version call, call the whole uh, target 4.7. So as, as a bridge 47, um, and perhaps we can jump in the next slide, uh, how, we, how we really see the importance of, of the um, role of the education. And, and in the first picture, you can really see that the traditional idea of the education is that you are putting human beings in the machinery and then um, giving them the tools and skills to write and read and count. And, and then the, the people are coming out from the machine and, and they are somehow ready made um, whatever um, parts of, of the society is to do what somebody else has really asked them to do. Of course, this is not very, very, this is simplifying a little bit on that, but that has been traditionally the role of, of this, especially for the formal education. But the formal education, unfortunately, it's not enough. It's fundamentally important to have that, but in parallel, where we can really have a lot to learn, a lot more, uh, if we are really using all the time what the people are doing out of the school or out of the work where they're really uh, developing their own skills based to their interest. They are part of the uh, of the societies, active citizens. They do take care of, of the other people. They really think how they consume, they vote. There are millions of different opportunities how to, how to really be the active citizen. And not only thinking about myself, but really thinking about all of us together that how can we how can we uh, uh, together find the good solutions for for the future but again in in these three types of education we need to take um, a next level let's put it in that way if we can have the next picture on, on the screen um, so already in uh, 1980s uh, Jacques Delors uh, who was leading the, the process in the UNESCO, um, that, that group of, of really intelligent people, they really uh, recognize and, and underline on that, that we need to have the attitude of learning. And, and the learning has to happen uh, for, for different kinds of learnings. It's not only that somebody's, I'm, I'm reading something and I'm, I'm learning something on, on that, but, but we definitely need to find the ways how how we um, uh, how we how we learn to do, how we uh, learn to live together, how we learn to be, and how we are learning to know, and all of these aspects and this attitude to learn some kind of lifelong learning, which comes back on that point, uh, which we managed to lobby on the agenda twenty thirty as well. All of that parts need to be taken account. But making this issue more complex, I think that we need to jump to the fourth picture in, in this slide, which exactly is having a look or the, having the skills to really understand that uh, we are living um, in, in a situation where we need to see the things as a, a, through the system level. Um, and and that's, that's why I think that we need to uh, we need to be aware, we need to really put attention that it's not all what we see. We, we 
we attend in the events or, or we are we are seeing some certain patterns in the people's behavior, for example. But that's also all, only the tip of the iceberg. And there's this much more bigger part under the water about the iceberg, which we definitely need to be aware and really understand that these invisible parts of the iceberg are those who are, who are heavily dominating exactly our behavior as, as a human beings. And, and that's why we need to put more attention on this why. What are the structures? Like Elizabeth already said on there, we need to understand that how those functions and, and then we, we need to really understand that what are the mental models, which majority of us, based to our um, education, based to our traditions, based to many, many, some kind of human behaviors, uh, what we have had and what we have collected during, during our lives. Understanding about this uh, under the water part of, of the iceberg helps us also to modify and, and make this upper part of, of the water part functioning functioning better and if we can turn to the next slide um i'm happy to give you a couple of examples not so many because i know that we have limited time here but just some kind of uh, change sometimes it works uh, but but the better idea really, yeah. you, you cut out for the last 30 seconds um could you oh. just repeat just start with this slide please with your example okay okay Thank thanks you. thanks 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 pointing this out so uh these are the couple of examples what we have done as a part of bridge 47 i'm not really going to explain every single detail on there just just give you a couple of highlights because we we think um, in in Bridge Forty Seven that that sometimes the business as usual doesn't function because of the system change because the environment is changing so rapidly and the challenge is what we are having we can't really have the simple solutions so so we decided that we are taking some kind of a test case and then we call it uncomfortable partnerships because we wanted to really work with the other partners who we don't really usually work and and um, for example we decided that we want to want to work with the uh, private sector or we want to work for example the colleagues in Scotland they work uh, with the uh, national health uh, system, so with hospitals, with nurses, with doctors. Um, we also wanted to, to work with the museums in Latvia and, and really um, finding the ways which could exactly uh, be the tools how we can talk about a sustainable future in the different ways. And I'm just taking the one example about the, um, uh, for example, the Estonian uh, broadcasting company which really have the prime time uh, TV times for everybody. And, and exactly, it's really, really amazing that uh, how using that uh, information channel as a news and as, as a TV company, how Absolutely, the, the colleagues, they covered the whole Estonia about the sustainable development topics. So that's really, really interesting, interesting case on that, that how you can really merging your joint interest, partnering, learning also from, from the partnering side, you manage to, to make the really interesting, interesting results on, on, on that. Um, on the right side, um, that I just shortly uh, would like to use as an example, which I think that is a good example about the systematic change is that uh, that's from Finland, uh, we uh, have the quite long history of the sustainable work and, and uh, the work is led by the National Commission for Sustainable Development. And a couple of years ago, we decided that... No. Hello. Really, you're, Can you hear? you're back. If you could continue I'm with a couple, a couple of yep. years ago, we. Yeah, right. a couple of years ago, in 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 Finnish case, we decided that uh, we are not following anymore about every single uh, seventeen SDGs plus their uh, targets, but we identify that what are the major areas where the Finland should put much more effort 
to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals by 2030. And, and as the outcome of, of that exercise, we identified six plus one, some kind of change areas where you can see those rounds there. Um, I'm just highlighting one of those, which I think that is, is really relevant, uh, relevant for, for that discussion, is that we, we um, noticed that exactly the role of the education, um, sustainable uh, living style, uh, civilization is fundamentally important, again, to think about that how it's, uh, itself in t- inside in that area we need to do, we have identified a key, key aspect where we want to focus but at the same time, it's also the tool for the other other system level uh, opportunities like the energy system or food system or, or well-being system. You, you need to really have the access for the information. Uh, you, you, need, you need to find your own way how you can really make, make the change. And I, I think that that's, that's really, really, really inspiring way because that has been also inspired the other actors who are not normally thinking the role of the education. So they have been really inspired and really get the point that exactly in the first level, you need to have the information access that you are really getting the whole point and not really going in, in the um, old, old style function. So we are right now, we are in the beginning of the implementation of this phase. So I can't really tell you yet about the results. I'm happy to do that in two years or so. But anyway, I, I think that as a model, it's, it's quite inspirational. And then it's really, really showcased that the ownership of the different actors to come together is amazing. And that automatically, because you have the common goals, it helps you as as well to commit on on that and everybody can really bring their own expertise on that of course there's ups and downs it was quite tough also for the negotiation to deciding that what are the priority areas um, but I, that's part of the process where you need to find the common interest uh, again that everybody is going to be heard and then based to the discussions and debate you can agree that what are the prior- priorities where we would like to focus on and then we are moving on but like I said, that's just in, in the beginning of the road. We don't really know that yet how it's going to be uh, happening. But I'm, I'm definitely more than happy to, to share you that results of, afterwards. But I think that I could stop, for example, here now. Uh, happy to happy to uh, come back on, on the more on after the other colleagues' presentations and, and the questions what you might have. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very kindly, really. I, I know you're traveling at the moment and that your connection is, is a bit challenging, but I think we heard everything that you had to share and you can see the applause coming in uh, at this time. Um, I appreciate your focus on active citizenship for sustainability that you were talking about. And, and it seems that there's a reinforcing loop there with, with this education as an entry point for, for the different SDG areas that that Finland is focusing on. And it occurs to me that the lifestyle focus, the education and lifestyle focus makes this accessible to any citizen in Finland and beyond. This uh, takes something that might look global and abstract uh, and can can make it real and daily uh, for for people to apply. Um, Thanks too for for focusing on learning, Um, learning to know and do, maybe we're very familiar with, uh, learning to be and live together, I find really intriguing. Uh, and I think we need lots, lots more of that. Um, so for participants, I, I don't see any questions yet, but you're very welcome to add a, a question into the Q&A icon at the, the bottom of your screen. We have just a couple of minutes um, for, for really to respond here. Uh, and go. I, I'm not seeing any, any questions, but if uh, what we could do really is if questions come in, you can also respond in writing uh, to those questions on a case-by-case basis. But let's just wait 10 or 15 seconds and see if we get uh, any questions coming in about your work, about things that you've shared. Uh, maybe participants would like to know that um, mainly through my colleagues, Elizabeth Kuhn and Martin Filko, um, really has been applying a collective leadership approach within Fingo for, for advancing the work that he does. So it's been a real pleasure for, for CLI to collaborate with him uh, in that way. 
Okay. Well, really, perhaps your your presentation was so comprehensive and well focused that we're we're not generating any questions at this time. So thanks again. Let's give really one more round of applause. Um, thanks for being with us, and please stay stick around for the panel when we'll get into into further further topics around challenges that you might be facing and also uh, potential solutions. All right. So um, next, I would like to invite Arun Ben Katesan to, to the stage, please. And uh, Arun and I have had the pleasure of collaborating um, through his work at Vilgro um, and alongside Co-Creative um, for, uh, it's almost been a year, I think it was last September, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, that we, that we started our collaboration on enlivening a social impact incubator network in the global south. And Arun's input today is going to look broadly, but potentially touch on this as one example um, for both um, investing and incubating uh, innovation. So as uh, by way of an introduction, uh, Arun is co-founder and CEO with Vilgro USA. And his focus today will be on investing and incubating for innovation, building trust and equity, both of which showed up in the Slido poll earlier, uh, in the social impact ecosystem. So the participants are primed, Arun, to, to listen in to what you have to share. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. I understand that you would like to, to share your own slides. So. The floor is yours. We're really happy to have you here with us. Great. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I hope you're able to see my screen. Okay, excellent. Yes. So um, <clears throat> thanks to CLI uh, for this opportunity to share what's been an incredible journey uh, in actually transforming, changing ourselves. So um, I want to preface by saying that um, Nothing you're going to see here is new. <laughs> and I think I'm, I was so happy to see uh, thoughts of fellow practitioners here, right? Everybody talks about transformation, but actually discussing uh, it with fellow practitioners is, is actually quite exciting and a privilege. So nothing is new, but uh, I think some things are worth emphasizing. So I'm going to be sharing my experience on what, uh, what this process surfaced and re-emphasizes uh, re to us. Um, that that is important uh, whenever somebody tries to build trust and equity in the system. So very quickly, a little bit of a background. Um, so Wilgro started in India about 20 plus years ago as a social enterprise incubator. Uh, Paul Basil founded it, uh, I'd like to jokingly say, before the term social enterprise and incubation were in vogue. And later we found out that <laughs> This was what we were doing. Um, I've been part of Wilgro's journey for about eight to 10 years now as a mentor, as a health practice lead and so on and so forth. Um, so Wilgro had incubated about 350 plus enterprises. Uh, we had trained about six or so um, incubators. Uh, a little bit of color to that is that we, we actually planted a seed and grew two other incubators in two other geographies. So the two were uh, became Wilgro Kenya and Wilgro Philippines. Um, and these were with deep handholding and support. The other model we were we had done in addition to uh, focusing on incubation is um, to train four other incubators in India under a grant. And that was uh, more of a, a existing incubators, but we actually trained them in social enterprise um, incubation, right? Now, then we started thinking about, okay, we are able to create some impact and we're able to do uh, handhold others into doing this too. But what is the path to really scaling our impact, right? Um, it took us 20 years to get to 350 enterprises and say six plus incubators, six or seven of them. So how do we scale this? And we set ourselves a target of something like three times impact in one fourth the time. Let's say train about 20 incubators in five years. Uh, so Wilgro USA, which was formed as a hub to coordinate uh, global activities, was tasked with this, right? 
Uh, and we went ahead and did this by training other incubators along three pillars, which is Inspire, where we shared stories of success with the community. We incubated other incubators. So it's that's that's a concept now, incubating incubators, uh, where we trained them through programs, through thought leadership and peer learning sessions, and a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring. By one-on-one, -on -one, I mean uh, will grow person in, uh, mentoring the team of the incubator. But how do we go global? Right? How, how can we make this organic and make this expand at its space? Um, and we realized that need that needs to be built bottom up. It was not just a revelation. People actually commented on this when we kept asking to others. Uh, our principle was always we need to build something, a network that's for the incubators, uh, focusing entirely on impact incubation by the incubators, right? Uh, so activities, everything is done by them off the incubators. So the composition should also be of incubators. If you look at the social enterprise ecosystem now, there's a whole mix of activism, but we really wanted to empower that layer. So if you think about it, um, if you're taking a few seconds to actually shine some light on what this ecosystem looks like, everybody gets excited about direct impact to beneficiaries, right? We want, say, the, the farmers to get um, subsidized seeds, et cetera. But if you see who is actually making that happen, it's the layer above, and that's uh, the entrepreneurs. And then the, the funders and donors and the change makers started focusing on the entrepreneurs, and that's how incubation was born. But this support system for the uh, entrepreneurs right above the um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, the incubators, the uh, entrepreneur support organizations, etc. is quite transparent. And so now we are talking about a network that's on top of this support layer. And so it's quite a bit of a challenge to prove and convince the need for that. But but it does exist. There is a great opportunity, right? There is the estimated about 7,500 business incubators there, quite a few of them as nonprofits. But the condition we found them in, the ecosystem in, was that there's super uh, high competition because there is a, a scarcity mentality, as opposed to turning it around and making it collaborative so that more funding, more opportunities can be unlocked. And this, this basically starts cascading down into compromised quality. The overall quality is known. And hence, this fragmentation exists in the ecosystem. So mobilizing human capital, right, talent, uh, mentors, uh, staff for the support environment is very difficult. Right. So this is the condition we, we find today. So what did we do? We wanted to, we set off the incubators by the incubators. Right? Somebody touched upon this in the thought cloud that, that uh, was uh, done before. Need-based, right? We need to really find out what the needs are. So we went ahead and collected stakeholder voices to surface key issues, right? But the trick is actually to read between the lines to figure out what, what are the actual systemic challenges. We talked to about 40 plus stakeholders um, who were exposed to Wilgro and were not, had not been exposed to the Wilgro, uh, Wilgro flavor. Um, some of some seven hub team members under our network, but then we also looked at like, six other networks and so on and so forth. Funders, net, other networks, other entrepreneurs and external ecosystem players. And we realized that one, we knew this, that majority of the operating models are not sustainable. Two, um, every, the most trivial challenge, right? Everybody can say this. I think it's in every ecosystem is funding. We want more funding at different levels. But funding, not just as operational uh, uh, sustainability, but also as a means to gain visibility and credibility in the ecosystem. That's the that that's how funding was looked at, because then this starts the virtuous cycle of being able to attract like internal and external talent. I think we talked about the human capital constraint, and then it, funding actually kickstarts this. And once you have more talent, you are looked upon as a more mature support provider, and this unlocks more funding and so on. So it's really. Uh, the systemic challenges we thought, uh, I'm sorry, we identified were um, funding, human capital, and 
stable next practices. You could say benchmarks and standards of operating, but it's really one common basis where you could measure performance, right? That everybody agrees on. Um, you know, how did we come get to this surfacing, right? Is is by talking to people, but more, it's not what we did, but it's the how we did that's very important. Uh, first thing we did was we gave up control over the process, right? We were typically uh, flavored by entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, so entrepreneurial driving was our mode of operation. We knew we had a plan, we made a timeline, we allocated resources and drove that to completion. But really, that's not the way to um, facilitate emergence, as we call it, right? So what we did was we changed over to what we call guided emergence, right? Somebody said uh, that, I think it was Elizabeth who talked about providing a space for things to happen, right? We really need to provide a space for that. Um, and that's what we did. We 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 said we are going to facilitate and hold a space for emergence to happen. So we we sort of started functioning like a secretariat. We we are not that yet, but that's the role we want to grow into. Be completely transparent about about our intentions. Repeatedly saying that I we are not here uh, as a funder. We may facilitate funding, but that's what we want to do. We want to empower the uh, impact incubators and keep saying that consistently. So there was transparency about the intentions and consistency. I think these two go hand in hand. You have to keep doing this again and again to build that trust. The other thing we did was, why would somebody trust you? I mean, you, you can be a nice person, nice cog in the ecosystem, but one needs to be careful that everything you do delivers value to somebody in that chain. Uh, here, the focus being impact incubator. So we gear all activities and constantly question ourselves, is there value uh, in what we are doing? Are people getting value? And we constantly tune ourselves and reshape ourselves to do that. And that's something that was important. In all our conversations, we kept asking that. We said, we want your input so I can you know, formulate a plan. I can make a charter. And the third thing we did, and the last thing is to understand that there are vulnerabilities. If you look at funding, the entire functioning is shaped by funding, right? Who holds the funds um, dictates a lot of things. And even though there are uh, people who are aware of this, entities who are aware of this, the power dynamic still exists. So we need to be careful to understand vulnerabilities, surface them, but also institute guardrails so that nobody takes unfair advantage of these things. <clears throat> the other thing I talked about, uh, I found that was essential to institute was equity. Uh, and we started out by doing that. Right? We had all training programs from our knowledge position, but we need to really do bottom-up building. You take a risk. As an entrepreneur, you take a lot of risks. But as a facilitator, you take a risk of this thing, whole thing might fail, but the process is sacrosanct. And, and, and also compromise on what we call perfection by saying it's okay to start with a mix of top-down, bottom build, no problem, but move towards a bottom up. So you involve diverse stakeholders, talk to everybody, every other flavor of that uh, uh, voice and, and listen to that. But that doesn't mean you cannot use existing players, right? You, you just retask them, use them differently, right? Let them dream and ask them about, forget about all the cons constraints that have shaped your experience. What would you like to change? And it's it's interesting, a beautiful concept emerges. The third is, there are going to be tensions, especially at the interfaces between the different stakeholders because their purposes are different. Acknowledge them and own them actually, and then leverage that, right? If somebody is very good at managing conflict, let them manage conflict. If somebody is very good at directional thinking, then give them focus and then let them drive parts of it. But the last thing we learned is be patient, right? How we do things were linear and driven. Now our job is to constantly refocus, to hold that space and let that to um, emerge. There are many things we found, impact incubators. We involved a whole bunch of incubators, I mean, uh, stakeholders. But we also made sure that geographies were rep represented in our diversity and acknowledge that not everybody can get involved at the same level, right? That's another mistake an organizer makes 
is to remember that some people will be excited about core design. Some people might only be have the bandwidth to co-design, as in you present them a framework and they contribute. And then a few of them would like to give their opinions and warn us against you know, with red flags, but actually move on, all right? Uh, to, to actually facilitate and uh, move this forward. Uh, so the other aspect of equity is to maintain neutrality. Uh, you facilitate this core design that I talked about, right? Constantly encourage, but the spirit of all this is to emphasize collaboration, which we wanted to build in the ecosystem, build it into the process, but emphasize it front and center. Make sure that you say this is a collaborative effort. This is collaborative effort at the beginning, at the middle, at the end, and pass the owners on to the participants. Um, so what changed in this is who we do this with changed, right? Instead of linear thinking and organizational thinking, what we did was we got process towards people who are experts in doing this, like CLI and co-creative, then proactively catalyze this participation. That is, uh, make sure that all time zones are represented. Inherently, any structure you design sometimes leaves out some of the stakeholders. Make sure that you go and address. What does that mean? It sometimes means one-on-one -on -one conversations to update people. Remember that diversity can be actually chaotic. But if you stick to a process and focus on a process that is string, uh, strong and a framework that uh, uh, is equitable, then insights start emerging. So in this process of different sessions, various kinds of sessions and conversations, we now had uh, roughly 150 contributors now, right? The core design team is only five and the facilitation team is only eight. But if you expand this, it goes to something like 150 contributors. Um, there is a few of them in our one of our co-design sessions. Um, I mean, we didn't force these smiles. They were voluntary smiles. So you can <laughs> see they were all excited to be part of it, right? So so what is what what one how minute. can I summarize our learnings from this, right? So okay. trust the process, trust the participants. More importantly, trust yourself because you're all united with a shared purpose, right? So summarize by saying if you want different results, you have to change yourself reinvent into your dream self. Change what you do from we did from driving to facilitating. Change how you do it. Right? Convene, collaborate and catalyze. Make, make others successful. Uh, that actually make value, add, add value to others. Then change who you do things with. Bring diversity and acknowledge all the differences. I think I'm going to stop there. Wow, fabulous, Arun. Thanks very much for this input, focusing on trust and equity for, for innovation and uh, the how. I heard you talking a lot about the process being participatory, focused on co-design and the ambition right at the outset. If I do my math right, I think you're talking about 12 times the scale. You said something like you know, three times the impact and one fourth the time. Um, thank you for bringing and centering this trust and equity piece. And I, I welcome people to, uh, to offer their questions. It seemed uh, from other participants that we, we did get three comments or questions um, for really, um, which I, I think might be answered already in the, the text chat or in the Q&A. And those might flow into the panel discussion that we'll have relatively soon. Um, do others have, if others have questions for Arun, uh, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, I'm not, oh, here, here's one. Um, all right, all right this, is, this is coming from uh, Waysam. I know that Waysam is one of our collective leadership specialists uh, in Egypt. And she's asking, um, do you think this can be done also with national entities uh, when we intend to have participants, uh, participation especially from youth? Um, so I don't feel free to, you can offer a verbal response there. I think this is also a reference to public sector and also to people of different ages. Yeah, I think most definitely, but I think it's important to understand, spend time in understanding the tensions that they come with, right? And the value that they expect. Um, what we found in dealing with global organizations because of our, ex our uh, experience is that, you know, there's some network fatigue that exists. So what you have to address that and deal with it. You have to be very clear about what, how are you doing things differently and what value you are aiming to deliver. And if, if it aligns with them, 
I think uh, national entities will, will come in. Um, again, I think it's this collaborative spirit. I, I wish I had a magic formula to give you saying this is exactly how the collaborative spirit is, um, is, is enforced. But I think being open about, look, I really want synergy and collaboration and we really would consider all your conflicting tensions and we would address. And I think that that can open this up is, is my simple answer to this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thanks very much. And, and for our participants to know, Arun, I don't think I'm revealing too much to say you have a background in engineering and come to this and say, look, the technical knowledge is important, but it's also not enough. It is about how we engage with one another, how we build relationships, how we build trust so that the, the co-design, what we're innovating is also collectively owned and then implemented. So um, thanks very, very kindly for for being with us. Stick around for the panel. Yeah, uh, so uh, one quote, some, uh, I read this somewhere that nobody um, cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. So, <laughs> so it, that's very important to, to, to show that you care. Then mm -hmm. people care about what you know. <laughs> thanks, Dominique. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful turn of phrase, Arun. And we'll be seeing you momentarily on the panel. Uh, now I get to invite Yvonne Waweru uh, to the stage. I have the pleasure of working with both Yvonne and also with, with Tim Andrew, um, along with colleagues Douglas, uh, Mai, Lulekwa, who are also here, uh, on an initiative that focuses on regional ocean governance and information management strategies in 10 countries across the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, so we're going to shift to innovation still, innovative approaches, uh, but also add a focus on, on regulation, on strategy. Um, Evonwa Weru, here on the stage, um, is Senior Advisor with the Western Indian Ocean Governance Initiative uh, from GIZ, that's the Development Cooperation Arm of, the, of Germany. And today she's going to be presenting um, on a topic that she co-developed with Tim. As we mentioned before, he can't be with us today um, because he was called away last minute. Um, Yvonne will be focused on innovative approaches for co-developing regional ocean governance and information management strategies for the Western Indian Ocean. And Yvonne, just let me recognize Tim as well. This is uh, Dr. Tim Andrew, is Senior Program Manager at the Nairobi Convention Secretariat. Um, you'll get to learn more about the Nairobi Convention momentarily from Yvonne. It's hosted by the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi. Uh, Yvonne, I'll share my slides for you. I'd like to welcome you and give you the microphone, please. Thank you, Dominic. And good afternoon to everyone. Good morning for those of you who are joining from other parts of the world. And I thank you to also, Dominic, for that introduction. As you've heard, my name is Yvonne Waweru, but this presentation has also been done together with Dr. Tim Andrew from UNEP, the Nairobi Convention. And it's done under the context of our ongoing project called the Western Indian Ocean Governance Initiative Project. And I'm going to talk about uh, some approaches, innovative approaches, on uh, co-developing two strategies for the region, that's uh, the Western Indian Ocean region. And uh, the strategies are uh, a regional ocean governance strategy and an information management strategy. Next slide, please. So for most of uh, you uh, who may have not been to the Western Indian Ocean region, let me just give you a brief intro. As you can see from the map there, it spans about uh, 10 countries, some are coastal states and some are island states. And uh, so this shared space uh, offers lots of opportunities uh, for the countries uh, and benefits, of course. We have uh, both social, uh, environmental and economic benefits. In terms of uh, the population uh, that lives around uh, the Y region, about 65 million people live within 100 kilometers of the coast. And uh, the benefits, the economic benefits have been valued 
uh, to be about 22 billion US dollars per year from different sectors, from tourism to fisheries, etc. And the total marine product has been estimated to be about 333 billion USD. So you can see that it's uh, quite some substantial resources there that benefit uh, the countries and the people living there. So um, there are several uh, activities, economic activities that take place there. For example, with regard to fisheries, uh, we contribute about 5% of the global catch. Uh, that's about four, 4 million tons per year. And uh, we also have new sectors coming up, such as the oil and gas sector, which is uh, has attracted significant interest globally. And of course, in terms of the environment, it's an important area and uh, a biological biodiversity hotspot. We have about uh, 40 EPSAs, what we call environmentally and biologically significant areas, and seven sea mounts in the region. That's quite a lot. We have uh, many species and uh, some of which, which are endemic to the region, about 13%. Next slide, please. Yeah, so with all those benefits, uh, there are significant challenges. Uh, some of them are current and others are emerging. Uh, so like with most uh, countries in the world, there's a challenge of uh, loss of biodiversity and habitats. And uh, these are, have mainly been caused by human activities, such as illegal fishing, uh, overfishing, and pollution and mainly from land resources. Uh, in addition to that, the new opportunities such as oil and gas, offshore oil and gas exploration and the expansion of ports, for example, and uh, building of new ports is also causing uh, significant threats to the uh, coastal and marine ecosystems there. All these compounded by climate change, uh, it's becoming uh, an increasingly important uh, area and topic and the threats uh, are being seen uh, at the moment. And also we don't have the uh, adequate governance. It could be strengthened to address with all these uh, challenges. Next slide, please. So um, maybe just to give a bit of context uh, on the wire region and from a governance point of view, so we have the 10 countries uh, having signed several agreements or treaties uh, with regard to the management of the shared ocean, ocean space. And uh, one of the most significant ones is the Nairobi Convention, which is a regional seas agreement with a focus on environmental issues. So, um, but even uh, if I go to the regional level, uh, ocean governance uh, has been determined as an important topic uh, at the continental level through what we call the Africa Ministerial Conference on Environment or AMSEN. And as you can see from this slide, since 2015, there's, there's been several calls from the continental level and the regional level to develop uh, an ocean governance strategy. And um, so at the last conference of parties, which was held in 2021. So the countries requested the development uh, of the strategies, both the two strategies, the ocean governance strategy and the information management strategy in a participatory process. So um, this is of course very challenging. Uh, there are many sectors, as I've explained from the previous slides, you have fisheries there, you have uh, shipping, uh, you have, um, uh, other sectors such as tourism. And in addition to that, um, you have several stakeholders from governments uh, to private sector and civil society. So uh, this is a very fragmented landscape. And for a strategy to be developed, a strategy that would capture all the relevant issues and be inclusive of all the stakeholders, it is quite um, a can be quite a difficult process. So um, what the next slides will explain how we were able to address this fragmentation to develop strategies 
uh, that were inclusive of the relevant stakeholders and also co-developed to incorporate the most significant issues. So uh, through our project, uh, the YOG project, we are supporting the 10 countries to take uh, this participatory approach to develop the two strategies. And uh, so what we did is that we set up uh, dedicated groups for each of the strategies to call it this. For the regional ocean governance strategy, we had a task force which had uh, the countries there, uh, the regional economic bodies there, science uh, representatives from science and civil society. So this uh, task force is what uh, is leading the process. So uh, it's drawn from different sectors and different stakeholders and engaging the broader ecosystem of stakeholders to develop uh, the strategies. And uh, we do this through engaging uh, on different topics that are relevant for the strategy. The ones in orange, for example, have been started or completed in some way. So uh, we've had technical dialogues on those topics with the relevant uh, stakeholders to um, define the priorities for that sector and the challenges and also the solutions that would then go into the strategy. So the ones in blue um, are yet to be tackled, but they will be done in the coming months as we finalize the strategy. So I've seen Dominic um, spell out what ABNJ is. Uh, it's areas beyond national jurisdiction and biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. I think this was mentioned earlier uh, about uh, cooperation that is happening in international waters uh, to address this. So for the information management strategy, we took a similar approach. We had a multi-stakeholder working group and it, the, its composition was a bit different uh, because of the nature of the topic. We had uh, countries represented there, science, civil society, and data and information specialists. Because this is uh, basically about how to share data and information uh, in a more coordinated manner in the region. So uh, for this, we had uh, three uh, dialogues planned. Uh, we managed to do one on ocean accounting, and the, the two will be done in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, to finalize the process. So um, in summary, I can say that uh, this is a, a holistic approach where you dedicate a special team, which is uh, in a way addresses all the relevant issues. And then uh, through this team, you engage the broader team of the broader uh, stakeholders and sectors that are not represented. Next slide, please. So uh, this, info, uh, this diagram summer, tries to summarize this very complex process of uh, bringing people together to co-develop strategies. And the stakeholder system, the, the broader stakeholder system has been engaged mainly through uh, technical dialogues, which provide input or context for the two strategies. Uh, if you can see, the, the, like there are three layers there. We have uh, the two task forces down there the, in the green part. And they're the ones who lead the process. They uh, help with the stakeholder dialogues. And then uh, in between there, we have a support team, mainly from GIZ and UNEP. So they act like the intermediary somehow or, or the support system for this dialogue. And then we have uh, the broader uh, actors out there being engaged through these dialogues. So um, out of this engagement and these consultations, the two products, that is the two strategies, will then go through a process of validation by the countries and, uh, and then thereafter taken for adoption by the next conference of parties in the next uh, couple of months. Next slide, please. So this is the, um, my last slide and it highlights what we've learned along the way, it's still an ongoing process, 
But uh, what we've seen so far is that uh, this type of stakeholder and engagement, especially through the technical dialogue, helps to capture you know, sector challenges and issues, which then go into the ROGs. So there are several communities of interest in this process. And their issues are varying, they are divergent. And I think for, for uh, to have to enhance sustainability in the shared ocean space of the WIO, we need some kind of cooperation or collaboration and also to address each sector's uh, issues and challenges. So, um, of course, each dialogue is different. And uh, at the end of the day, um, the practitioners working in that particular sector are able to articulate better what ails them and what needs to be addressed in their context. And uh, secondly, is that this approach enables uh, ownership from a very early stage. So from the beginning to the end, uh, there's been quite a number of consultations. And when we go to the validation process or you know, the adoption at the conference of parties, they, there'll be some form of ownership because they've uh, participated in the development, in the defining and the framing of the issues and even writing of the strategy. Um, however, um, there, uh, there is a challenge with that approach. Uh, it is very time consuming. We've started, we started this process in uh, late 2021, early 2022, and we are still in the process of uh, developing the strategy through the webinars. So they're not complete, most of them. So it requires uh, some innovation or to be versatile to ensure that the participants remain engaged, both you know, the two task forces and also the broader uh, ecosystem of stakeholders and to maintain the momentum until the strategies are developed. Uh, so a leap into the future and you know, lessons learned for the future. We hope that through this process, uh, there'll be increased cooperation across sectors uh, in the WIO, uh, given that each uh, sector is somehow um, represented uh, in the task force and also their issues have been incorporated into the strategy. And this is really what we aim for in regional ocean governance, to increase cooperation across sectors. And also uh, related to that is increased stakeholder participation in regional ocean governance. Uh, these are, for example, the private sector actors and the civil society. So they, they have a voice in the governance of the WIO. And we hope that this will contribute to more effective ocean governance and support a sustainable blue economy in the region. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, thanks very much, Yvonne, for, for your input. Um, you're clearly talking about uh, a really broad and diverse stakeholder system, a complex stakeholder system across 10 countries. We're talking different levels, different sectors, different languages spoken. Uh, by, by individuals uh, across the whole region. Um, CLI is really grateful to play a supporting role with, with GIZ and with the Nairobi Convention in helping do precisely what you're talking about, Yvonne. I think you're also resonating with Arun and really about participation, about a holistic approach, um, You know, taking also something that's very innovative in my understanding for the region is that the, this Ocean Governance Task Force and Information Management uh, Working Group, these are multi-stakeholder groups. And so involving non-state actors is a big deal. Uh, some people might say, oh, regulations, that's just the domain of the governments, that's just for public sector. But in this case, YOG, uh, GIZ, and the Nairobi Convention said, no, let's, let's take a different approach to build ownership, to build further cooperation. As you said at the end, um, no, it's not easy, but will we reach perhaps the most robust results? There's high quality strategies, collectively owned, and ultimately wanting to increase the chances for implementation. Uh, I see a couple of questions for you, Yvonne. I'd like to take one or two and then move to the panel. Um, there's a question that asks a little bit more description, um, also from the, the public sector side. So what 
government agencies or institutions across the different countries have been mobilized, for example, in the, in the teams. Maybe you could give some examples uh, there uh, to describe the teams. And then a related question uh, on process. You know, there are multiple agreements that the Nairobi Convention is making. I think this question is also about the process leading up to early 2024 when we would have the next conference of the parties. What does it look like to get these strategies approved? Okay, so thanks uh, for those questions. On the first one, uh, first of all, let me say that the Nairobi Convention is an environmental uh, focus convention. So the focal points or the foundation is the ministries of environment. So, um, however, um, this being a very uh, complex system with several sectors working, we also have representation from, for example, ministries of fisheries. We have uh, shipping uh, representatives there. We also have some from economic, you know, economic sectors. So there are several ministries represented, but uh, the focus or the entry point was the environment ministries. Mm -hmm. And I think the second question was about the process. Yeah, the formal process for, for strategy approval. Okay. So we hope to have the draft strategies after we finish the stakeholder consultations and the technical webinars by quarter three of this year, hopefully. So the next process is uh, the validation through the Nairobi Convention focal points, who are the focal points for the convention from the ministries of environment. So once they validate this, and of course with the inclusion of uh, other stakeholders, it will then be presented to the next conference of parties for adoption. That's uh, early next year, quarter one of next year. So. Uh, Unless uh, anything major happens, we hope that uh, that process will follow through. Um, thanks very much, Yvonne, uh, for your, your presentation. Um, and we're, we're going to, um, you could take any further questions in the Q&A. At the, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. But I would love to move to the panel. Um, so I'd like to invite my colleague, Douglas Williamson, uh, back on stage along with the, the speakers. Um, or Freezing up. But um, I guess I will take it from there. I think Dominic invited me. So I'll grab the mic. Hi, everyone. Douglas Williamson once again. And uh, thanks so much for uh, for your inputs, really, and Yvonne, Aaron. It was super interesting to listen to you all. Uh, we're going to shift into a different kind of a session now, just quickly, to be a little bit more democratic and participatory ourselves. Uh, what we'd like to do is we would like to invite um, uh, everybody who is in attendance today to join a Slido poll and allow me quickly to share my screen and then I will give some instructions. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a different style now. So the speaker panel entailed is taking a look at this Slido question. So going to Slido and thinking about what are the entrenched challenges that you still see in applying innovations and regulations for advancing inclusive democracy and good governance. This is a question for the participants. In the Slido poll, which you can join, um, you can use your phone or you can use your laptop. Um, please take a minute to think about this and formulate a question. Once you've formulated a question, look at the other questions that have been formulated and take some time to upvote or give thumbs up to the other statements. The top one or two statements judging from time, probably the top question or statement, uh, we will throw back to the panel. And um, the panel, whoever is interested in talking about the challenge identified, um, we can have a little bit of a panel discussion. We'll do that just for a few minutes, and then we'll move on to a second Slido poll, which is dealing with solutions. So first, click under the Slido poll um, and um, pose your question, upvote your answers, and we'll, we'll rejoin in a moment. I will leave this screen up and 
you can join the Sligo poll. Go for it. Okay, I see the first challenge is starting to be identified. But let's give this one a couple more minutes. Please feel free to type in your challenge identified. Right, a couple more are coming in. It's great. All right, please take a look at these questions. We've got five questions so far. Have a read of them, and if you like them, vote them up. Oh, we've got seven questions now. Dominic is going to share his screen. Thanks, Dominic. Focus on the set challenges identified now and upvote the ones you think are the most important. A lot of good questions in there. Let's just take one more minute to upvote because there's so many good challenges identified. Okay, let's come back into the, the main room now. And I would like to just to highlight that the most popular of the question or sort of most popular challenge identified uh, is been the public stake, public slash stakeholders um, are not always aware or engaged how to encourage interest in an overwhelmed society. Ooh, this is a very tough question, but it had eight upvotes. So why don't we start with that one? And um, with that one, I'll just, uh, I'll just, thanks Dominic for putting it back up. The public stakeholders are not always aware or engaged how to encourage interest in an overwhelmed society. So um, with that being said, and we have um, Yvonne and Aaron and, um, and really there, um, I would like to to invite um, uh, Aaron. I see that you've got your camera on and you're looking very alert as always. Um, would, would you mind taking a, a, a little bit of a reflection on this question, which is how do you get public and stakeholders aware and engaged um, when they're so overwhelmed with so many of the challenges we're facing in society? So we've seen this in the innovation ecosystem, right? So investors uh, inherently have a power dynamic. Uh, but I think data, presenting data is another way to get both of them involved. So public entities have inherent power and sometimes uh, use money to consolidate that. And 
they um so the investors and the funders have inherent power because of money so one way one constant um problem we see is that the information presented to increase awareness is always very um anecdotal or agenda driven so bring neutrality supported by some data it's a, it's a data driven world now there's so much data available to so bring that front and center and be be transparent about it sometimes biases in the in the overwhelmed public can be overcome with that data and promote discussion uh, be neutral don't take a stance in promoting a or b as a, as a facilitating entity a uh, very quick example was um, when we started our work well through our partner in kenya will grow kenya which now is will grow africa we realized the pattern was that um um indigenous kenyan innovators got much less investments compared to expats and foreign trained innovators who started uh, and so we brought that front and center to the funders and said why is this happening uh, the funders had some issue saying uh, our capital needs to be catalytic so we need to unlock local capital we cannot always be helicoptering in with funding and solutions so this was an interesting dynamic that got so fast and i don't know if it worked out but the 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 percentage the the, the dynamic has shifted so i i bring uh, the data to the table is what i'm thinking being neutral about it and i'll let others uh, answer add to this uh, thanks aaron for this you know the the question um itself was was very broad question about about society in general and i think you're absolutely right providing people with data um on accurate data and believable data is very important i noticed that one of our speakers who's uh, joining us on friday bruce goldstein if it's the same one which i'm assuming it is there could be a couple out there who are in in attending our our our, our conferences but he also mentioned something about the sort of post truth um the sort of post truth era that we're living in um you know the the work that uh, that really um is is doing and i i noticed that this is a very broad work that um to to introduce new educational norms as, as as well as from a network perspective and so really i feel like this question uh might be relevant for you in thinking about um the, this the sort of very deep and underlying systemic issues that you've identified the mental models the structures that are underlying um uh how how can you or how do you really from your perspective from a network and from an education for sustainable development perspective how do you uh i sort of deal with this challenge of um stakeholder or public unawareness or um disengagement um or overwhelmedness what is your perspective uh on that challenge identified thanks thanks for the question which is very tough one as as for at least not very very easy one if it would be we would solve it all already uh but i would like to come back on on that point that that people need to have the access for the information and the data and and all of that background so not not so so that's really is is the key some kind of starting point that you really know what's going on um and and then the second one especially when you're talking about the politics is is really so unbelievable un understandable jargon which of course makes the the difference as as well on that that people don't really get the clue that what's going on there and i think that really really talking in the human being language is is really the starting point that we need to really talk about the, what what are the really the real challenges and and trying to find the some kind of practical solutions and and using the common sense which comes back to the education so that exactly in the education exactly the best results of the education is that people are equipped in already an and always changing environment so that you really are not in panicking immediately when some kind of boost is coming from the one direction but but really being aware on that and there's turbulence is all the time there has been and there will be more turbulence is but i think the role of the education is really giving the tools for every human being every single um individual individuals to find the ways and be creative and i think that that's really is another point that how exactly we can inspire using the imagination 
and really being creative and, and finding the solutions because you can't really exactly copy paste about the something uh, the same models you need to modify that anyway uh, and that exactly is the beauty of, of the processes as well that people can really develop on, on the solutions which really fits best in in circumstances where, where you are living or not that but I, I would say that exactly the access to know really what's going on based on the facts not about the rumors or whatever other other times so really really getting the facts right and and then really thinking collectively as well so really bringing the brains together and thinking that which which might uh, work in the best way of course doing the failings as well which is part of the learning and I think it's absolutely okay that that you need to allow about the mistakes and, and all of that we are none of us we are not perfect but I think that this attitude to really thinking that yes the the life is adventure. How could we really use that in the best way? So these are just for the first reactions coming to my mind. Uh, thanks, really. No, I, I really appreciate that as well as uh, you making the connections to Aaron's comment. Um, and I'd actually like to pass it on to Yvonne. You know, one of the components that you are working on within the Wyogi project is information management. Uh, strategy. Um, that information management strategy is mostly intended not really for the general public, but is intended for decision makers and politicians uh, to be able to, to make um, adequate um, decisions regarding policy and regulation decisions. We are talking about, um, about uh, regulations today. Um, and so I'd sort of like to ask you, Yvonne, listening to to your, your panelists, Aaron, and really talk about data and the way that data can inform us. Um, how do you see the work that you're doing uh, within Wyogi or the Wyogi project in general, um, sort of with its data management and data, um, data generation, uh, how does that trickle down past the policymakers uh, to, tr to, to, to treat this um, question or challenge identified about how does that trickle down into helping a public become less overwhelmed and more engaged in this kind of work. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Douglas, for that. Let me begin by saying that uh, governance of anything, or at least in the ocean space, is not about government only. So it extends uh, to other stakeholders that I said, like civil society, private sector, and even the public. So with regard to data and you know, getting it out there, first of all, you need to understand that uh, there are several sources of data and information that are already there, some within uh, the domain of governments and some without. So perhaps one, one of the easiest ways to do it is to aggregate all this data and information into a structured format that can be useful for both uh, the regulators and also the public. So how you do that really depends on your context. Uh, so for us, through the information management strategy, for example, we've uh, mapped out what information and data already exists there and then trying to put it in a useful format. So the next step would be how to make it accessible and available to everyone, uh, including the public. And a key uh, component of this is how you communicate. And in particular, how you communicate science, complex topics uh, in a way that is understandable to the public. So um, science communication, of course, is a specialized field, but I think uh, it's important to see how uh, scientists can speak to policymakers and how scientists can also speak to the public about the issues and challenges in the ocean. So for example, if you're dealing with local communities, they may not necessarily understand, they may have indigenous knowledge, but they may not understand the complex complexity of the issues there. So you have to find a way of uh, communicating to them and also using the appropriate forms such as the media etc. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Yvonne, and really, and Aaron, for your, your reflections on this challenge identified. Um, I would like to jump to the next Slido poll. Let's do this again. You guys generated the participants who generated a tremendous amount of challenges identified. Let's do the same thing, but this time let's focus on solutions. So now we're going to move and I'll share my screen again. 
Here we go. So this time, potential solutions. What do you see regarding innovations and regulations for advancing inclusive democracy and governance? Once again, you can go use the same link, pop in there, type in your potential solutions, upvote the ones you think are really interesting, and, uh, and then we will pass it back to the panel for a very brief reflection before uh, we have to close the session. So please pop into the Slido poll again. And Dominic, you can share your screen again, please, so we can see what's happening live in the Slido. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. But you did a great job the first time around, so I'm sure that you're going to do a great job this time around. Dominic, feel free to share the, the Slido screen. I think people are giving it a, a moment thought, and then we'll have some responses coming momentarily. Starting to emerge already. It's good. And please don't feel pressure to write um, a solution, but please read the solutions. And if you like them, support them. Got a pen suggestions for solutions so far, please feel free to read and upvote the ones you like. Take just another minute to upvote. All right, I think we have a uh, we have one that has emerged as the uh, the the uh, the leader here amongst this community. But thanks everybody for all of your. Um, all of your suggestions and Martin, if you would, if you wouldn't mind copying uh, this into the chat box again, like you did last time, that was fantastic. Really appreciate it. I will stop sharing the the screen if that's okay, Dominic. Um, and we have the the um, the most popular um, of our potential solutions was teaching humility, cooperation, and collectivism is better paradigms than competition. Uh, so this is a, very much over into Ridley's corner. I feel like this is a, a big ESD, global citizenship, uh, education for peace, um, uh, a suggestion here as a solution. Really, um, let, me, uh, let me pass it to you because this really, I think, nails ESD on the head. Um, would you reflect a little bit on this particular solution? 
I very much agree on on that. I, I think that that's really is is the the key point. And exactly, I was just reading that. I was seeing the. I don't know how where you are about this so famous uh, wedding cake model, where exactly the sustainable development goals those seventeen has put in different levels, and exactly in in the basis there is the environmental goals. So we definitely need to really take care of the environmental situation. And without that, we can't even build the societies. And then the last one should be the economical progress. And I, I think that that's really, really uh, is is really fundamentally important because if we, as a human beings, don't really take care of of the environmental aspect, we can't really do anything with the money as as well. What what we definitely need is some at least. A little bit on that, but I think that it really comes on the better hierarchy on that. That how we how we live here, how we are not really going to kill each other, how we are really respecting each other, how we are really finding the common solutions. And I have to say that because I'm I'm now in Strasbourg, uh, I've been attended in the Council of Europe uh, meetings, and it's really really amazing. This old institutions uh, built after the Second World War, the oldest one in the Europe. Um, and it has been really some kind of a sleeping dog for for decades, and now it's really having had some kind of new birth at the moment. And the reason is Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. So I'm just thinking that this is awful. That we need to really have some kind of big enemy or, or something really really critical happening. That the monsters are waking up and, and somehow finding this identity and really thinking. And the identity of the Council of Europe is human rights and democracy the fundamental values where we should really build on everything what we do. And in, in that way, I think it's really sad that we need to have this kind of crisis where, where the, the really the people are really reacting and then waking up that definitely we need to live based on, on the values. But anyway, good news on that, but that the monster has been woke up and hopefully they are really doing the good decisions and, and really based on the human rights and, and the democracy and all that. But I, I think that we need to have this... Um, some kind of structures and the good principles, but it's only paper if we are not implementing those. And that's why I think that the people are those who are implementing the laws and the standards and the norms, etc. And we need to really mirror on that, that how we behave and how we are really using those for, for good for everyone and the natures as well. Thanks. Uh, thanks, really. Uh well said. I can't. I can't agree with you more. Um, the, the 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 sort of basis for our culture of peace and building a culture of peace into the work that we're doing, as well as you know, really large concepts of care, um, uh, to teach those to to future citizens or future global citizens, uh, fundamental. I think um, I, I'd be interested to hear maybe just a couple of words from from Aaron, how that plays out in the work that that you're doing. Um, uh, or how you see that playing out in your innovation incubators. See, um, I think what I really liked and what is underplayed uh, in what really said and in this presentation is that systems thinking aspect. Um, you know, uh, innovation ecosystem is quite focused on value delivery, right? But I think the key key remains now in shifting the focus from I to V saying that how do we we deliver value to us rather than a, a, a particular focus on a particular subsector, right? a segment of society. I think uh, as facilitators, as change makers in this ecosystem, we should be thinking about broadening the value uh, delivery uh, focus. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> At least move from I to V. That V may be constrained, but it's 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 a the good step. We would like to be uh, to quote the fam famous title movie title everything <laughs> everywhere all at once. But at least the thinking should move to the broader ecosystem is what I'm thinking, and that includes the environment, the the, the immediate environment we live in, the global environment, um, equity in across the world when global economy economies overlap, stuff like that. But I think that's been key. Um, if you if you look at how we advise entrepreneurs and other incubators, we say, who else is there in your value chain? Who else is there in your ecosystem? Uh, if, without delivering value to them, you cannot really sustain your progress. It may be short term. To make it long term, you understand how you 
uh, um, uh, are uh, making others succeed and move along uh, the value chain. And and I think the same thing uh, applies to um, you know what Yvonne is doing and what really is doing. And really, this awareness of what else is happening is, I think, is important. If you integrate that into your thinking and the thinking of everybody else in the ecosystem, I think we will move towards where we want to go. Uh, that's my Thanks. thought on this. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate your reflection. And I, I do want to give Yvonne a, a sort of a final panelist word to talk briefly for just a minute or two also on, on how you see these values uh, being played out or being important in the work that you're doing in this uh, you know, ecosystem-based, but very much ecosystem-based for um, improving the lives of these 50 or I think 100 million people who are in the, 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 the region uh, of the Western Indian Ocean. Yeah, so thanks, Douglas. So first of all, um, if we don't collaborate or you know, use the we, there'll be no survival, definitely, for everyone. Uh, so whether it's uh, competition for resources, uh, or the competition among different users in the space, uh, there has to be some compromise that has to be made. And of course, uh, the people should be at the heart of it, and not just the people, but the ocean. Uh, because if you destroy everything, then there'll be no resources for tomorrow. I mean, there'll be no livelihoods, there'll be no jobs, there'll be no economic development. So, however, I think that sometimes it's easy to say that we need to collaborate and co uh, cooperate and also to partner, but it's not easy in real sense. So you need to have some kind of dialogue and where you address the conflict and say, okay, so uh, different stakeholders or actors want different things, but how do you reach consensus? How do you achieve uh, the trade-offs? in the most um, agreeable way as possible. Yeah, so that uh, always has to be at the back of your mind when you're trying to do that. So um, in as much as we know what should be done and what the ideal situation is, we need to be a bit pra pragmatic on how we get about to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne. And thank you to Yvonne and to Aaron and to really uh, for your excellent participation and your presentations, your thoughts and reflections. Uh, it was really inspiring to hear all of you today. I also want to thank uh, my co-facilitators, Dominic Stucker and Elizabeth Kuhn, uh, as well as in the background, Katrin Schultz and Martin Figo uh, from my team who are really helping out today as well with a lot of the links and a lot of the technical management. Uh, it went very well. I'm just going to share a screen quick, fast. I always get selected to do the wrap up because I have a motor mouth. So here we go with the end of our conference today. So first of all, let me announce. Um, I've announced this the other day. I'm going to announce it again. We are, uh, CLI is um, launching the Transformative Partnership Award. Uh, this Transformative Partnership, um, it, it, it's open to anybody. Uh, but if you have a multi-stakeholder approach and contribute to the achievement of the SDGs, um, please nominate yourselves, apply yourselves, or find other people to apply for this prize. The prize will be next year, a financial contribution to your partnership initiative or and or places in our certification program. Applications for the 2024, 2024 award are now open. And of course, this will be announced the winners at next year's transformative um, Transformation Literacy Conference. Um, so if you want to learn more, please check out the link or click on or uh, use the, the QVC code um, to, to get more information. And of course, you can always contact us if you have questions. Um, finally, um, next week, I'm sorry, not next week, on Friday, we're having the third of our uh, Transformation Literacy Conference 2023. Um, we have great speakers. We have Bruce Goldstein and David Manuel Navarrete, who are going to be either joining together or one of the two. Bruce was with us today. Thank you for your comment, Bruce. We have Dr. Anke Giesen, Manuel Rojas Oyarzo from the German Bundestag, Mariana Zaviska, our close collaborator from Ukraine, and then Elizabeth Kuhn, our, um, our director, will also be doing a wrap-up session at 1600 CET. Um, this Friday session is going to be focused on governance and structures. Um, so please join us same time, same um, same format 
um, on Friday. We're looking forward to seeing you then very much. And um, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, this has been a, a fantastic session to follow up our first session on Monday. Um, please uh, share the link. We still have plenty of space available for people to, to participate in Friday's session. If you're interested in becoming a specialist in collective leadership, check out our specialist leadership uh, certification program uh, for this year. And feel free to stay in touch with us. Our email is germany at collectiveleadership.com. And I think that being said, I've ended the program in well within time. And um, I will leave it at that. And I want to just thank everyone once again for attending and participating, sharing your great insights, questions, suggestions for solutions. I will stop the screen share there. And hopefully that is adequate. Once again, thank you to everyone. If you have a moment to check out in the text chat box, Martin has posted a little checkout question. What's the one thing that you found most inspiring today? If you want to add that, feel free to do so. Uh, and if not, thank you so much for joining us today. Aaron, Ivan, and um, uh, really, thank you so much. Elizabeth, Dominic, Martin, Catherine, thank you all so much for being organizing and bringing your great energies today.